Hey, welcome to the Growth Whispers podcast, where everything we talk about is about being obsessed, driven, motivated, curious about building enduring great companies. That's companies that go for decades, uh, not days or months or years. And helping leaders and their teams actually to make that happen. I'm joined today by my co-host, Brad Giles. Brad, how are you doing today? Hot. I am hot, hot, hot. It's 40 degrees here today. First of the hot days here in Perth, Australia, uh, getting ready for summer. Um, and it's good. It's, it's, we've had a bit of a cooler time, but yeah, I'm hot today. Um, yeah, looking forward to a good chat about enduring great companies as always. So awesome. Oh, and, I, and I'll take that that yeah. hot is Celsius, not Fahrenheit, right? Oh, yeah. 40 degrees, which, what oh. is that? Oh, I'm not a calculator, but 100. Double and add 30. It's probably, yeah, it's, it's uh, 110. 110-ish? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, 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 that's nice. Yeah. Well, it's uh, not that. It's probably closer to 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Vancouver right now. Great. <laughs> My my cousin works in the mines uh, in in the, the the outback of Australia, and in the mining pit it gets to like fifty five Celsius um, and peaks like up to fifty eight. Yeah, it's quite hot up there. So I'm quite uh, happy to be in this mild forty degrees Celsius. I bet. Yeah. Awesome. So so what are we digging into today in our in our, our exploration of endurance? Well, <clears throat> we've been chatting beforehand. What what are we seeing? What are we seeing that's happening around with clients and observations? And and one of the things that we've noticed is many people are having record years. They're, they've re reacted. They've reacted well in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, they've stabilized. The governments have put a lot of money in, and now people are having record years. And, and in fact, many industries are booming. Uh, so we're yes. going to talk about that. What do you need to do about it as a business owner? What do you need to do about How do you react to that? And how do you keep the mindset of an enduring great business in these boom times? Yeah, because it's confusing. I was working with a client uh, last week and we're, you know, we're trying to set budgets for next year. It's hard. I mean, often budgets are a bit of a guess, but it's a wild ass guess because it could be the same as this past year and it could be 50% more and it's a substantial sized company. It gets, the variance is massive. And, you know, and some people are thinking, well, maybe we should be conservative and plan conservatively. And some say, well, we should be aggressive because there's incredible opportunities out there. And it's like, how do you how do you plan and budget in these times? And it's it's challenging. Now, some business models have more of a fixed nature, yeah. i.e., they can't <clears throat> dramatically scale up in a year because of constraints, um, and that might be a you know a set for their upper limit. But other ones have lots of flexibility in their model. So we're gonna we're gonna dig into that. But first. Let's you know, some ideas on how to budget. Let's first talk. What are the things that we're seeing? Like I say, you know, a huge portion of our clients are having best years ever, like ever. more than people would imagine. And we talked about this before. Uh, so you've got a strong, you've got a spectacular year that a lot of companies are coming on. Now, if you're obviously in, you know, in restaurant and hospitality, that's less likely, but in lots of other industries, it's, it's outstanding. And so planning based off that is a, is a massive debate. But if we look at things like different segments, like in, 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 in Canada, you know, trucks, you know, um, certain types of RVs, off-road vehicles. Um, I, 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 from what I understand, um, boats and many other things during the summer because people were staying home and increasing their consumption. Vacation properties. Um, you know, grocery businesses are, are in many cases are stronger because people are buying from grocers instead of eating at restaurants and eating at home more. There's, there's many, many spaces where we've seen, you know, a, a big trend of people, you know, getting out of the big downtown cores and out of the cities and wanting to move to the suburbs or people in there wanting to get into some of the resort areas that are that are booming. So there's, there's lots of it. 
and in many cases, I know Brad and we're talking about this, like here, it's like almost pandemonium. Yeah. It's scarcity. Like I had a friend and he needed to get a new truck. You know, he's doing an important trip he was going to do. He's bought a lot of trucks from this one dealer over the years. They, you know, they bought 40 or 50 trucks off him. And he goes like, I really need a truck and I need to buy, I need to buy one Monday. I got cash. Let's go. The guy's like, we don't have any. He goes, no, yeah. no, no, no. I, I, I need a truck. You're a truck company you're a truck dealer you sell <laughs> trucks you specialize in trucks i need to buy a truck he's like well <clears throat> anyways this guy had to pull strings left right and center and find ways to get a truck now mm -hmm. this is like a hundred thousand dollar pickup truck you know it's a diesel full load ford pickup truck it ain't a cheap purchase you know it's not a commodity purchase and they were they were next to impossible and still are to get so it's, you know, in many cases, it's scarcity and people will just take it and it builds this whole momentum of its own where you can't have it. And same thing happening in real estate. There's no supply and, you know, the demand is there, you know, interest rates get dropped. Supply is tight. People will sort of, you know, everything's all of a sudden, whoosh, everything sells. It's the same here. And that's really what's prompted this conversation today. Like there's, we've got some early stage indicators that, that, things are happening and things may happen as, as a result of that. Here, um, I saw something yesterday. If, you're, if you go to a dealer to buy a jet ski in New South Wales, in Sydney, uh, you, you have a wait. Uh, the, the, the first time they can order one or you can get deliveries, October 2021. That's today before we even, you know, like, and it's just growing. It's the same for caravans, uh, like you said, boats, uh, so, so many, tubs, same with four yeah. wheel drives, hot, wheel, hot tubs. So a, a lot of the recreational stuff, the, the, the money that people were spending on holidays has been diverted in. Uh, into internal consumption where I don't need to go away. And that's kind of logical. It's backed by sure enormous is. government stimulus. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of money washing through the economy right now. People are spending website developers. I've got clients in marketing and website development. You can't get people for love nor money. You just, they just simply aren't there. And, you know, pay rises are in the tens of thousands um, to keep people. So, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's, it's, it's not only the, the recreational equipment, it's beginning to translate over to, to, to jobs as well, certainly here anyway. Yes. And even we're having a conversation today with um, someone who's in the hiring business we do, you know, and, and we were discussing about talent in the marketplace. And, you know, what people, what people are finding is that the, the, the best people, you know, aren't as, as available in the market. The A players aren't moving. They're kind of, if they've got something good, they're holding on. It's kind of like, you know, you're locking down in the storm. Yeah. And so it's actually harder to get talent right now for many people than it has been in the past. Now, there's more people looking for jobs than there's ever been. But they're generally not in the segments. You know, if we're a lot of our clients looking for, you know, managers and leaders and things like that. You know, in the hospitality segment, there's lots of people in the market that, and there could be some really good ones. But in other segments, you know, there's a lot of people, but it's harder to find the, the cream of the crop because many yeah. of them are just, you know, working with what they have. So there's lots of challenges and there's opportunities. But the thing we're talking about is there's a lot of people going crazy. Like the economy is booming in many, many segments. And, you know, you were, we were talking before about a quote that from, you know, Warren Buffett, as I recall it, is that when people are greedy, be fearful. And when people are fearful, be greedy. Now, whether that's attributed right to him or not, that's something that's stuck in my mind. And I think about him. Yeah. And, and right now it's like, you know, people are being greedy and the market is, it's pretty intense. So the question is, how do we go into 2021 knowing all of this? You know, if we're too fearful, we'll be too conservative. If we're too greedy, we could hurt ourselves. And how do we find that right balance of, of, of where we push and capitalize on opportunities and, and, and um, yeah, and, and don't, you know, don't push it so far that we get ourselves in, in trouble. I was, as I read before, I was right now, how do we, how do we capitalize without capsizing the boat? <laughs> and that's kind of, that's kind of the theme of today. I know it's cheesy, a little Canadian cheese there for you. 
you know, from our great, you. yeah, but you know, it's, yeah. How we like we to spread a bit of Canadian cheese over the top on a, a regular Canadian basis. cheese never hurt anybody. <laughs> you know, we might prefer to have some Wisconsin cheese because they're known <laughs> to have outstanding cheese. Uh, but I think Canadian cheese is decent. Actually, you know, or Italians also make some great cheeses, but, but that's a different I'll type tell of you, cheese. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, people lose money in a downturn and people lose money in a boom. Right. Yep. I mean, where I live, we're a mining based economy, something at the moment, like 47% of the, the economy is, is coming from mining. Uh, and it goes up and it goes down. And it's just this terrible boom and bust economy. And one thing that we know, we don't know much, right? But what we know is that you lose money on the down and you lose money on the up. And, and you lose money on the up because people become greedy because people want to scale people pay over market for things and they become desperate and they get deal lust and they don't remember oftentimes the timeless principles that see businesses become successful. They get caught yes. up in the euphoria of the moment. And if you want to build an enduring great business, you need to maintain consistency and stability in the euphoria of the moment. Yes, and it's the discipline of growth, yeah. right? It's being aggressive and conservative at the, at the same time and not, not losing your way. And people do get excited. And you know, the, the rule of thumb I use with investments, you know, by the time, you know, my parents or, or a taxi cab driver starts to give you stock tips, you know, you're in trouble. When it, it's, it gets quite predictable if you watch it. When cryptocurrencies really took off about two years ago, I remember one of the cryptocurrencies, the main one hit about 20,000 bucks mm. per unit or whatever it is called units. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember everybody was talking about it. And again, it was down to the point where the cab drivers were talking about it and giving you tips. And when cab drivers are giving you stock tips and finance tips, the market's normally about to melt down. Yeah. And that's what happened with cryptocurrencies. And that was probably about two years ago when there was a big meltdown and it was the hype. And that's just the way markets are because they're psychological. People get all hyped, hyped, hyped. It boils over, it gets frothy, it's a bit too much. And then something happens and boom. So I'm not saying that we can predict it. But it, there's a lot of indicators that the market's getting a little bit frothy and a little bit crazy. And we know markets go through cycles. I would never expected this kind of boom in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Right. Never. And, and um, there's people much smarter than us, I'm sure that may have, but I, it doesn't seem logical, but it's seeming frothy. So, but it could continue. You don't know. So how do we do well during this? And we got some, some ideas to really help us to, to basically stay aggressive and opportunistic and, and still maintaining some of those, some of those short-term disciplines. So we don't get in too much trouble, which we've been doing with our clients. So we've got, you know, seven different ideas that we've seen people doing that are, are good things to consider and, and hopefully can be helpful for some of you listening. You want to, you want to kick us off on number Let's one. Let's do that. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I guess, <clears throat> The, the overarching um, concept is you've got to maintain long-term discipline in the midst of the short-term challenges. Um, so the first one is that sell like hell, right? If it's a booming market, you've got to capitalize on it. Um, but, and I, I really love this. We did an episode maybe about 10 or 15, maybe even 20 episodes ago about gross margin. It's an awesome one. And, and we're coming back now to that. So we should let the gross profit dollars, the gross profit dollars dictate our investment decisions. Now, what happens? I mean, I was in a meeting only yesterday and uh, a quarterly planning meeting with a group. And we're saying, okay, so how, how do we... How do we predict our next quarter in line with the longer term goals that we've got of the business? And all of the heads of the departments, we've kind of got two different parts there, but all of the heads of the departments, like I need four people, I need six people and numbers are just being thrown around. And I just keep coming yeah. back to, so what does the budget tell us? What does the budget tell us? And they're going, you don't understand. We're, we're too busy in this area. I'm like, okay, we've got to have some kind of level of discipline 
to hold this whole thing together because otherwise what we'll find is uh, we'll go two or three months down the, the track. We've got 15 new employees and suddenly we're saying, why are we only making 1% profit or losing money? Like this happens all the time. Right. Profitable businesses become and, unprofitable and booms. And you would use the numbers to help you make your hiring decisions, but now I think you need to use a different formula. Yeah. Because in the past, let's say for every additional million dollars of gross profit, you would hire one more person in an overhead position, for example, right? Million dollars of gross profit would be a hundred thousand dollars of overhead, right? So that you know, that's that's ten percent of 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 gross profit. You know, that would be pretty lean, probably. But let's just say it's a lean overhead business. Yep. So let's just say that was your trigger. Well, if you're in turbulence, you might stretch that number to one hundred and fifty, or you might wait two months to see if it sticks so that you just don't go higher by your normal hiring ratios because it could fall just as, in many businesses, maybe not yours, but in many, it can fall just as fast. And I, I remember advice that stuck with me forever. Unfortunately, this gentleman made a very bad career limiting mistake. He was one of Warren Buffett's right hands. He was wow. speaking at an event I was at and I grabbed him on the way from his talk and picked his brain you know, all the way out of the hotel to where he, when he was leaving, going back to the airport. Um, his name was David Sokol and he ran a company called NetJets, fractional aircraft ownership in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. He was in charge of turning it around. So he did a great talk and I was, I was picking his brain and he connected me with a few other people to get some more information for some of my clients on their approach. He had a great discipline for managing execution. Um, but one of the things he talked about is, the thing he learned is you hire people when you get to 130% capacity, not 80. Yeah. And many businesses pre-hire for growth. And you almost always get your fingers burnt. He goes, if you hire when you get to 130, now you might be working the pipeline and getting, but if you're hiring when you hit 130, you don't burn your fingers. You don't end up overstaffed or over overheaded because you're always running lean. And he goes, just, you know, work the system and, you know, be ready when you hit 130 to drop that person in, but don't hire at 80. And that yeah. same thinking I think would be excellent right now is how do you make sure your hirings at 130 over a two or three month period, pay your people some overtime, give some extra bonus, whatever you, you got to do to take care of people, to but get use it to the very yeah, because yeah. because because in the past, you know, a lot of people would, would do hire at eighty or ninety, and it get, that gets you in trouble sooner or later. So and, but that, I that mean, kind the of conversation that was awesome. The, and don't let me cut you off too much. The conversation that we were having yesterday is we need to hire three marketing people so that we can create the leads, so that the salespeople can capitalize on the opportunity of the market. But we need discipline to underpin this. Like it's, it, you can't just, you know, that it just. You don't just, have to do it all today. No. And we're all impatient. But if you're going to, now, if they have 47 marketing people that are already producing and they have a system and they want to hire three more, awesome. But if they have one and they want to hire three or yeah. two and they want to hire three, that seems like I could be getting ahead of yourself. Maybe not. Yeah. And what's it going to do to your cash reserves? Like this is, yes. Um, you know, growth sucks cash. If you, let's say you hire three marketing people, each of them are on a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand dollars each. It's $300,000. Um, how are you going to, how are you going to recoup that cash investment right. uh, in the first year? Now that's some simple math that may be too high, but the point is what is, what will your, uh, investment decisions do to your cash. So we're considering exactly. the gross profit dollars as you grow. So we know there's opportunities. We want to bank that, but we want to capitalize on that. But we've got to also consider the cash reserves that we've got totally. and higher based on gross profit dollars as we're bringing them in. Yep. And there are businesses that hiring those three marketing people would be a no brainer because it's like buying discounted dollars. It depends on the model. We're not saying don't do that. Yeah, we're just saying you really got to think about these things. 
and just so you can be prepared to make sure things produce and you have flexibility in the system. Cool. So, Let's go to number two. And then this is sort to, of tied to in close it two. out. To close yeah. it out, uh, hurry up and slow down. Um, it, exactly. Good advice that I've had before. Just right. hurry Don't up. Don't get ahead of yourself. Down. Make sure yeah. you can back up the bets you're making. Second one is to be aggressive. But by the way, backing up on that, you know, and, and I think this is this it'll fit into this one. But be aggressive and entrepreneurial when you see medium-term demand you can fulfill. So if there is truly an opportunity, charge the mountain, go for it, chase it. You know, really go after. It. You know, one of our clients um, is booming the most of any client we work with. And I can't even tell you the numbers, but it's unbelievable how they are thriving in this economy. They see another opportunity. They're going to hire a bunch more people and aggressively chase after it. And their, their, their balance sheet can handle it. Their income statement can handle it. They're, they're following that gross, you know, the gross profit model and just really maximize it because what they're saying is you know we want to continue to build our army because we're building for two or three years down the road yeah and right now we have an opportunity we can get more amazing people and have them winning because they are winning with a capital w it's setting us up beyond this this pandemic to be an even better company in three to five years and they see how they can bridge that now there's a bit of risk in it they've calculated it but they're going to be very aggressive on some other opportunities they can see that can take them beyond this. And, and, but the difference is they've had to loosen processes a little bit. They're running a little looser than they normally run to let the business be entrepreneurial and capitalize on things. So not loose, just a little looser. So think about an Olympic runner, uh, aggressive with discipline, y yes. you know, uh, or any kind of sports person, they're aggressive with discipline. That that's what yep. you know. That's what we're kind of saying. It's there, but but aggressive without discipline is is going to hurt a lot. Um, there's no doubt about it. So let's move on to number yeah. three. Well, before uh, we do though, oh yeah, but we're doing it. Their flywheel is dialed in, and we know how we're performing on different aspects of the flywheel, and we're investing around their flywheel. Their people. We do talent reviews every quarter and, and the percentage of A players is climbing and climbing and climbing, which is one of the reasons why they're killing it, right? So there's a boatload of discipline in behind the machine. And because we have those disciplines, we can push hard and take other risks. But if you don't have those kinds of discipline, you know, they, they have an outstanding team with excellent focus and they, you know, it, it's, so it's, it's easier to be aggressive when you have those kinds of disciplines and systems. And yeah. quality in your systems. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Brad. Hit us with number three. A beautiful segue. Um, and my favorite. So it's don't accept mediocre people. Or only hire A players. Um, they're hard to find in any market, especially this market. So I want to take you back about a dozen years, maybe 12, 13 years ago. Um, remember I mentioned earlier that I live in a boom bust economy. 12, 13 years ago was a boom. We've, we've, we've been in a bust for about the last four or five years, uh, but that was a boom. It was the mother of all booms. Uh, and what was happening, um, we, we were so short of labor, um, we would bring someone in for an interview, we'd advertise, we'd actually get someone to turn up for an interview. They'd have the interview, let's say for an hour or two, um, they'd go, they'd turn on their phone as they walk out and you could hear their phone beeping with all of the voicemail messages from all of the other employers trying to ring them up. And this is not a players. This is just people with a heartbeat. Just, um, just people. Yes. Just people. Um, and it, it speaks to the, the, you know, the challenge in a booming market. That's an extreme example, but it's almost like, you, you know, you, you throw money at them, you, you offer them salaries or wages that, that you feel incredibly uncomfortable with and they don't even bat an eyelid. Like it's, it's just, it doesn't even mean anything to them um, because the market is so hot because they're, everybody's doing the same thing. Um, so that, that's a, that was then, this is now, but the overarching thing is don't accept uh, non-A players. Now, what we did 
it to, to counter that is we adopted a long-term strategy and we said we've got to get untrained people who like we always say sh you should we've got to get untrained people to come into to a, a four-year training program like an apprenticeship uh at people who fit our character that we'd get them literally from yep. school uh, we'd, we'd have a work experience program. We brought them in, uh, identified the right character because we there was a large people of there was a large group of people who were untrained in school where we could identify the right character, and we simply slowed down and took a long term approach uh, to get the A players, and that paid off massively for us. Uh, but you know, in this busy market, I'm already seeing lots of conversations about how hard it is to get people. So yep. don't slow down, only accept the A players. No, because then you build a house of cards. You yep. bring in the wrong person for the job and you think you're getting ahead, but you're going to fall down anyways because they won't work out or they won't love their job or they won't do good work or they'll be toxic, whatever it is. So it's false progress. It's, it's, it's not a great strategy. It's always the great strategy to build your team with better people. Now, if you need to do something short term, you can, you can outsource, you can use contracted labor for the short term. If it's not core in your business, there's other, other, you know, you can take your, you know, one of the firms or people you work with and get them to handle some of it, but yeah, hold on for people. And if you can't get enough people, you probably need to say to some notice some of those opportunities because then your business will not deliver as expected. So, because you don't want to get to the other side, you don't want to get to the other side of the boom, and then you're left with a, a handful or a, a large portion of really mediocre people that got you through there. Like that, then you've got to kind of start from, you know, let's go back to number one, Jim Collins. You've yeah. got to get the right people on the bus. Then you've got to clean out your bus to start again. Like, don't. Let, don't get seduced by the, the the growth opportunity. Just slow down, entry only right. accept A players. That goes into that amazing quote that I had up front, Brad. Capitalize without capsizing the boat. You want to get to the other shore. You don't want to end up upside down in the sea in the middle of your journey. Isn't that yes. sweet? That is, we could write that a fairy is, tale about that. See. Okay, let's move on. Number four. Um, be careful of indigestion of opportunity and that, that could either really hurt your business, i.e. your ability to deliver quality uh, or your or your team. Like there's only so much like I, I, I was sharing with you, you know, we got a call today about a company that has a, a very challenging and urgent need. Mm. And, you know, I was talking with my team tonight on our, our weekly meeting about, you know, can we take this on because there's work to start like this week or next week, you know, yeah. can we take this on and deliver to the quality that we need at our end and to the satisfaction of a client? Of course we want to help. They really need help and we can help them, but do we have the bandwidth to be able to deliver what they need when they, when they want it? And you know, when someone really needs help and you know, you can do it, it's, it's, it's easy to say yes. But sometimes you put yourself into a bad position as well. And, you know, um, it, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to say no. And whether it's because you really want to help people or because you know you can make an extra couple million a profit, which is not in this case, but if it, you know, in, in different business models, yeah. it can be the case of an extra couple million a profit, all kinds of other things. Um, but then you can jeopardize what you have because you overburden the system. And the other side of it is, or you overburden your people, right? Like people are tired. Many people Already. are tired and need a break. And it's, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, so it's just, to, it's to be conscious of, is there actual quality bandwidth to take those things on to deliver it to your standards? And if it's not, then you know, what's your alternative? Well, people are already super super tired um and if you're going to take on a big project if you're going to take on a uh, you know a, a, a large a large growth opportunity you're just gonna you're gonna put at risk the existing team the existing um players like there could be a really big hangover that results from that now 
be aggressive with your growth, but to be disciplined and and push the team. Remember the 130% thing that we spoke about earlier, like push them, don't push them too hard, be conscious of what's happening in the team. Um, and, and be, I guess, yeah, <clears throat> know that, yeah, people are excited by the opportunity for this growth. People, people love taking on big new things. Of course. Um, but I've seen, you know, there's a, there's a saying, um, profitable businesses go bust every day because they run out of cash flow. You take on a big project, it could suck up all of your cash. And then suddenly you've got a whole new problem to deal right. with where you're thinking you're going to get a heap of profit at the end, uh, but you run out of cash flow. So yeah, or, be or it becomes distracting. If it doesn't go well, it can suck a bunch of leadership time to manage the problems, even if it does make the same amount of money, or you would take on board a whole bunch of risk and that can burden you. Or like, there's so many things that can get you. And that's why it's staying in your sweet spot, knowing what you can do and deliver and, and yeah, not overdoing it and getting too excited. You know, there's a there's that thing about you've seen the, 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 the TV shows or the commercials where they, you know, the kids go into a candy store and eat too much candy. Yeah. And they're having a sugar hangover afterwards. And sometimes we can get caught up in that. You know, it's 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 indigestion of too much of a too much of a good thing. And, yeah, uh, it's you know, um, you <clears throat> if you read enough business magazines or business websites, you know, what they talk about is the extraordinary, the really unusual. I mean you know, we've got a, a list in Australia called the Fast 100. What's the fastest 100 growing companies as many sort of areas do or many countries and regions do. Uh, they write about the companies that are doing things that are really unusual because they are really unusual. Uh, <laughs> yes. They're not the norm. Like, I mean, I was number four on that list in my company years ago. Um, and, and that's lovely to talk about, right? But that doesn't build an enduring great business. No. And, and they don't write about, in fact, we saw an article this year about an amazing enduring long-term, a, a 1,000 year old business, but you very yes. rarely see businesses that are enduring and great. They're, they're, they're more abnormal than normal. Yes, because the abnormal is more interesting normally. Because it's yeah. dramatic and splashy and it's up and it's down and it makes noise and all this other stuff. And uh, yeah, that's not consistent with building an enduring great company. Although it, it can be really fun on the way up and a nightmare on the way down. And we're trying to <laughs> not have the nightmare on the way down. So let's, let's move on. Yeah. The other piece of this um, is to be very nimble and prepared for really fast decisions. If things all of a sudden tick up or tick down. Like you need to be on, and there's two parts of that. It's, it's you know, ability to make decisions, like having the mechanisms, the information, knowing you need to make a decision. And then psychologically, because there's, 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 there's a principle called consistency of commitment, which Robert Cialdini talks about in, in his book. And uh, influence. And, and one of the things he talks about is once you've said you're going to do something and you take steps in a certain direction, you generally want to continue. Yeah. Because you said you would and you did. It's almost like you're starting to build a habit or going down a road. Well, if you say that we're going to achieve this or we're going to build this and we're going to do this, and then all of a sudden the environment changes, it takes some strong leadership to kill a, kill a project to change a decision, to go a different direction. And, and that's because we generally want to follow our commitments and we don't, and especially if we've already spent money, it's called sunk cost. We've got sunk cost and we, we feel the need to support it, but you got to fight yourself and you got to fight your ego and you got to fight the desire to be right. And you got to fight, you know, the desire to make it work. Um, and that's hard. And especially in a market like this, if things could change very quickly one way or the other. And it's very easy to get to get deal lost, to to get enamored by the 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 market. You know, record profits, record growth. Re you know, yeah. there are so many things that are happening now. But the flip side of that, um, you know, let's go to productive paranoia that Jim talks about. Jim Collins. Yeah. 
okay, so we've got trade wars, um, we've got a pandemic, uh, we've got uh, governments entering into eye-watering levels of debt, we've got interest rates at their lowest level ever. Like there are, that, and that's just covering off the super top headlines. Yes. Um, you know, there things can happen really, really quickly in such a volatile environment. Now, I'm not a pessimist. Let's be aggressive towards the opportunities, but you know, have a hair trigger. Be prepared to act because things can happen really quickly. Yeah, um, I had you know a number of clients in the oil and gas space, mm. and when it gets good, it gets really good, and when it gets bad, that business almost falls off the face of the earth. Yeah, it's incredible, and that's why when they when when you do well in oil and gas, the profits are can be excellent. I remember one entrepreneur I worked with and you know, I'd been through a few different cycles and when it was falling off the face of the earth in one cycle, you know, the, the, the mantra I was sharing with them is hold your net percentage, hold your net percentage, no cash goes back in, hold your profit, no cash goes back into the business. And, you know, I was, and again, he managed to, to, to navigate through it and not fall to prey to his previous decision, which is very hard because in that business, that's what they do. <laughs> you know, you have yeah. to almost be a little bit cold hearted because it's such big swings. Yeah. You're going to have 600 employees one day and, you know, within a week, you can be down to 200 or 150. Like yeah. it's incredible how, how it can swing. So Moves on so to the number, next, which kind of leads into yeah. the next one. Um, number six, so stay in the market to help see trends and opportunities. So you've got to, you, you've got to be prepared to move fast, but equally, um, you've got to be prepared to um, to spend time either on the front line with front with, with front line customers and employees, uh, knowing what's happening. You've got to be absolutely ready um, and and there's meeting rhythms that help things like the daily huddle things like our start stop keeps that we've spoken about before on this podcast uh, but you've got to stay absolutely in tune with what's happening because things can turn on a dime uh, and things can happen really quickly so that you can make those changes yeah so, and, uh, you know, and even on the, on the, and the previous one was a CEO I was talking to today, Fast Decisions, you know, even just on the pandemic, purely on a pandemic, there was a couple of cases that came up in one of the locations and in a, in a speed that would make other, most people's head spin, they closed the location for three days, had deep cleaning, like cleaning, like never gets done in a decade yeah. of the whole place and, and clean, right? Like incredible cleaning like it should be done mm -hmm. um, uh, to the point that some people thought they were crazy and it was unnecessary and everything. And, 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 and also, but brings back confidence in the employees and the customers and doing the right things. So that's on the internal, but on the external, just staying abreast of what's going on. And, and the CEO was talking about how they spend a lot of time, you know, listening to podcasts and news and things to be plugged in on, What's going on with the vaccine, and what are the what, what's the future of work look like? And a lot of energy to try and try and stay connected to what's going on, and it's both strategically, but even even in the specific business of where are the opportunities? What is the customer wanting and or needed? And you know what I've noticed with CEOs, the thing that they have, they can see and sense things that other people can't, and, and same with with excellent executives. Yeah. They can be in a conversation and they will ask questions that no one else would think of because they generally, from their peer view, see things and patterns that no one else sees. You know, a different CEO was on the phone with today. It was today was a, you know, a bunch of different calls. And another CEO was telling me, but one of the questions they asked in a meeting with one of their most important customers. Now they were mm. in the meeting. It's a substantial company. They were in the meeting with a very important customer. But the question they asked was like insanely brilliant, which had a problem will have a notable impact. But but if they hadn't been there, the other people might not have seen it. And for them, it also gives them some intel, which led to a conversation we have to an action that we're going to take that could be massive for the company. 
But if they hadn't been in that meeting and they hadn't asked the conversation that no one else would have asked, like all, there's a whole chain yeah. of events that comes from being really connected to what's going on. Uh, it's a volatile environment uh, on, on so many levels. And it's great that there are opportunities. It's great that it's booming, but it's a volatile environment. Things can happen and you want to be ready when those things do happen. You want to, you want to be one of the first people to know about it. Let's put it that way. So yes. let's move on to number seven. Um, be prepared for a bust after the boom. Uh, so everything goes up, everything goes down. There are, there are long-term trends. But if we're saying that, that in many parts of the economy, we're observing booming conditions, one day those booming conditions will change and it will... Uh, it will not revert to the, the long-term mean indefinitely. Uh, uh, things will go up and things will go down. Um, and so what happens to you and your business when things go down? Uh, or put another way, there will be a hangover. Uh, will you be prepared for that? Um, Jim Collins. Will, will you have the aspirin and the extra water you need? Right. Or to be able to even better, did you drink? a lot of yes. water the night before before I you always went to forget bed. that one i always remember <laughs> that one in the morning and like oh i should have drank more water, especially if it's red wine but yes so so yeah how, how are you going to be prepared for that and that's that yeah. productive paranoia that's having a big fat balance sheet you know it's, it's just about it's about being in a position where and all of these things be prepared so that you can be ready to make those decisions lots of people have plan b's so when's right. it going to go down? Sense. When's it going to go down? Someone might be thinking. Of course they would be thinking. And that's exceptionally hard to predict. We don't know. We don't we, know. We don't, we don't know. But we know it will go down. And we know when it goes down, you know what you're going to want to do? You're going to want two things. You're going to want to act quick. And you want to, you're going to want to, I'm going to say that very impolite term, right size. And you're going yes. to want to have lots of cash to weather the storm. You know, that could be think in a month is, or in two years. So last weekend, me and some friends were up in the mountains and we went this thing I shared before called snow biking. Mm. Take a dirt bike or off-road motorcycle, put a snowmobile trad in the back and a ski on the front and away you go. But it was funny because it was a couple of my friends who were, you know, successful entrepreneurs. And um, like, well, but we were all prepared for anything. Like we got backpacks. First of all, we had extra gas. So we could keep riding a long time, but we had extra gas. We had some tools. At one point, something came up hard on mine and we had to tighten it up, but we had some extra tools. Shovels to dig ourselves out of the snow. A special SOS satellite radio that yeah. if something happens, we can push a button and get in instant help. Like, and, 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 and. But it's like, we're prepared. We're prepared for an emergency. Mm -hmm. and we're fairly far back in the mountains so again it was all very smart but it was interestingly like we were all productive paranoid and all very prepared like oh some would say over prepared but that's that's the way we're wired and that shows up in our businesses as well and it's you know it's those extra oxygen canisters and what would those be you know so that you no matter what happens or in the in inevitable event that something goes wrong how are you going to be able just to go yep okay Let's just breeze through this and make the tough decisions and it'll all be good and don't have to go into full-blown panic mode. Which many people will. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's another Warren Buffett saying, when the tide goes out, you can see who isn't wearing bathers. Um, you, you know, <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, that's not who you want to be. Use, if, if there is opportunity now, Maintain at all costs your gross margin percentage. Uh, grow around gross margin dollars. Add people around gross margin dollars. And then the, the byproduct of that, it shouldn't be um, to drain your balance sheet reserves. It should be to improve your balance sheet reserves. So if you think a month, six months, a year, two years into the future, how can you use this boom period if you're experiencing one? and to grow a stronger balance sheet. 
Yes. And at the end of the day, the idea here is, is as business people and business leaders, we want to make the most of what's going on. We want to help more customers and make better returns for the, for the shareholders and create more bonus opportunities for employees or whatever it happens to be. So we want to really push on it. We just got to do it eyes wide open, fully prepared and smart so that we can thrive and to go back to where we started so that we can capitalize without capitalize cap, without capsize capa capitalize without capsizing the boat that's some export grade um cheese from can canada canada there okay. awesome um all right that's great uh so with that closing out on that export grade canadian cheese uh let's move to close so quick review of what we've said there's a boom at the moment okay we're certainly observing it it may not be everywhere let's just take that as a given but we're certainly seeing enough of it that we feel obliged to talk about it in booms people go bust people lose money there is no guarantee whatsoever that you're going to make uh, that your business will come out the other side better. So you need to apply discipline and consider the long term. Um, so number one, sell like hell and get the gross profit dollars to drive your investment decisions. That's one. We've got to employ people or purchase equipment uh, based on uh, discipline around our gross profit dollars and how they're growing, not just thinking that build it and they will come. Number two, be aggressive and entrepreneurial uh, where we see medium term demand that we can fulfill. So maintain your aggressive in the midst of the other side of the coin, which is discipline. Number three, don't accept mediocre people. Uh, don't take anybody with a heartbeat or even people who aren't A players. Um, they're hard to find. It's harder in this environment uh, but you've got to find interesting tactics to be able to get them um, because it will hurt on the other side. The next one is um, don't take on too much. Indigestion can hurt your business and hurt your people. We've got to be uh, really conscious of taking on too much that we can cause structural damage to the people or the business. Five, be prepared for fast decisions. Things will happen and you've got to be ready to make big decisions real quickly, which plays into six, which is um, know what's happening. Keep your finger on the pulse. Talk to employees at the front line. Talk to customers. Get a deep understanding of what's happening there. And then finally, number seven, um, there will be a downturn afterwards. Everything that goes up goes down. Um, so you need to maintain your oxygen canisters, as Jim Collin puts it. Uh, you need to be able um, to have cash reserves and be in a better position based upon the discipline. Great summary, Brad. So <clears throat> with that, um, thanks for listening. It's been great to have you here. Hopefully from this, you've been able to gain a little bit of help to deal with this boom. Uh, I'm Brad Giles, and as always, joined by my co-host, Kevin Lawrence. You can find me at uh, evolutionpartners.com.au, and you can find Kevin at lawrenceandco.com. Uh, for the YouTube version, obviously go to YouTube to see the video. Um, thanks very much. Have a great week. We look forward to chatting again next week.